for five minutes, please. Try to ask as many questions as I possibly can in a short amount of time. Um, starting with uh, Mr. Caldin and uh, and uh, Netflix. Um, one of the things I, I've learned is that uh, season three of the Umbrella Academy is uh, premiering in June. Of course, starring uh, the Stratford Festival's Confiore, uh, and I understand also which which again Stratford Festival opening week is this week. Uh, everyone come to Stratford, um, which of course is filmed in uh, Ontario. The, the um, Umbrella Academy would the Umbrella Academy account as Canadian content? Um, it also stars Canada's Elliot Page, um, and no, uh, Umbrella Academy would not count as Canadian content. So when you're investing $3.5 billion in Canada, uh, employing uh, many Canadians, including, including, I'm assuming, one of uh, some of uh, Mr. Lewis's uh, members, uh, all of that um, in investment uh, doesn't provide you with any um, benefits, if you will, uh, from the Canadian content system. Am I right to assume that? Well, it's just the definition only recognizes a subset of uh, the productions that we uh, that we make in Canada. Um, as I mentioned, um, projects that we own or fully finance are not recognized because of the copyright ownership uh, requirements in current certification criteria. Um, the content that we uh, that we work on in collaboration with Canadian broadcasters and independent producers does count uh, towards uh, CanCon uh, certification criteria. Thank you very much. And I may come back to you if I have time, but I want to switch to uh, uh, Ms. Patel and, uh, and YouTube. Um, we, we've talked a little bit about the policy directive from the minister. Um, we haven't seen it. I'm assuming you haven't seen it. Uh, we heard earlier that the CRTC hasn't seen it. Um, so a lot of what will come out of C11 will be... Um, defined by what the minister puts in his policy directive. Um, we know that policy directives can change, that a future government could issue its own policy directive and redefine things. So we've been told the minister will go a certain direction uh, with a policy directive, but we have seen nothing in writing. I wanted your thoughts on that aspect, on this policy directive that no one seems to have seen yet and are just taking the just trust us approach from the government that it will be what they say it will be, and I guess what they hope it will be. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing I'll say is that um, what's amazing is that there is an alignment when it comes to, you know, the question of user-generated content and whether it should be within scope of the bill. There is alignment in terms of the minister's intention uh, and and certainly, you know, what we've heard mm -hmm. from the creator community, uh, that, that that content should not be within scope of the bill. And I think really what we're asking is for that to be explicitly. That, um, um, what's amazing is that there is no line. Still, I am when it sorry. Comes to, I am know, sorry. Question. Just a second, please. There is noise uh, that's interrupting um, any anyone's ability to listen. <laughs> uh, please, can people mute their phones, uh, their microphones, uh, on the floor? Thank you. All right, I'll start again. Um, I think, you know, going back to, I think we're all aligned on the intent here. And when it comes to the role of, you know, how should that be reflected in whether that's in legislation or a policy directive, I think, you know, the creator community merits and uh, the certainty of how their content, which is their livelihood, um, will be regulated going forward. And that's why I think it's absolutely appropriate and very achievable, by the way, to, um, to reflect that in the legislative text. You know, I think we don't have to put the livelihoods of creators at risk to support, you know, Canadian musicians and artists. I think we are all very collaborative and smart people, and this is something that can absolutely be done uh, in the text itself. And I simply would, you know, I, I, it doesn't, it's not clear to me why we would, um, you know, give a, this expansive discretion to the CRTC in the text of the law and um, on, when we're in the premise that this is not going to be regulated, and if that premise is it's not to be regulated, then I think that it makes the most sense to have that reflected in the text rather than handing over the, the authority to future governments to simply make that change uh, going forward. And, and in my uh, 30 seconds, which I think the chair will extend by at least a minute, given that small interruption, um, uh, we, we talk about the global reach that YouTube has. Obviously, you operate in... in 
countries globally. And we look at successes like Justin Bieber from Stratford, Ontario, who has found success through things like uh, YouTube. What is it? What is it that's unique about new technology, about new platforms that allows Canadian content to be viewed and to be uh, celebrated and, and find success uh, globally and around the world? The most amazing thing is that niche content that never would have had an opportunity, uh, wouldn't have had a large enough audience in uh, conventional media that is constrained by, you know, programming time and geographic reach. So, you know, someone who, uh, like Simply Nail Logical, who has 7 million subscribers for nail art, right? Absolutely amazing. Uh, that kind of content which... isn't going to break through in mass media, but there is a global audience for it. So by putting it in front of that international, the world stage, really really gives uh, those creators up, a chance. Thank you very much. You may expand on it in the next, any other questions.